Good morning, First Baptist Church. How's it going out there? All right, we want to welcome you back. We're so glad you're here worshiping with us. And for those of you online on Facebook and uh, also on our website, we want to welcome you as well. And on 89.3 WNSS FM in Palm Coast, so glad that you are here joining us to worship with us. Isn't it a great day? What a beautiful, beautiful day that we're having today. The weather has been wonderful, and uh, it's a great day to praise the Lord. We're going to start off, we're going to sing about just how faithful and just how, how uh, our God is the rock of our salvation. So let's sing the solid rock together. joining us virtually. Uh, welcome to our family on WNSS uh, 89.3 Palm Coast. Glad you guys are with us today as well. As we get started today, I just want to celebrate how the Lord, man, we serve a good God, don't we? Do you agree? Do we serve a good God? Absolutely. Yesterday, a significant event happened. If you're joining us uh, out of state or uh, in another country even uh, online, just know that God is at work in this community. Yesterday, we had a dozen churches come together in a, in a marvelous way, an amazing way, kingdom-minded. Uh, it wasn't about any specific church. It was about the kingdom of God and the advancement of the gospel as churches came together to serve this community. We saw after all was said and done, there was about 3,500 families that got 
food yesterday. 3,500 families. That's amazing. That is amazing. Just think, just think in the future what God can do if his people come together, work together for the cause of Jesus Christ. Amen? That, what an amazing, amazing accomplishment. Today, if uh, you'll uh, refer to your song sheet, I just have an announcement or two I wanted to highlight as we begin. Uh, is, if you're joining us at home, you can go to our website at www.fbcpc.org. That is First Baptist Church, palmcoast.org, uh, the first letters of each uh, word. So as you go there, you'll notice two things on the sheet. Uh, one is an Adopt an Island program. We have 10 islands. Now, some of you uh, were like, an island? Where do we own an island? That'd be cool, right? The Caribbean, right, Frank Favaro? Which island in the Caribbean, right? Uh, I'm talking about the islands in the parking lot here. And so since this is our sanctuary, we want to do something to spruce it up. But we don't want to take money away from benevolence and the things that we're doing to impact people's lives in a real way. And so we're asking you to pray about it. If you want to be involved in it, we're going to put sod down on each of these islands, these 10 islands, to make them look like the islands that are newer in the newer construction. Uh, why we didn't do this when we were building, I don't know, but this is what we need to do now. If the Lord leads you, it's about a $300 charge to put down the sod per island uh, and the irrigation system. The uh, We're working that out with the company. All of the irrigation is working. We're just making sure it's working correctly. And then also that includes a, uh, a plaque with your family's name on it. And so that will be on your island. This island is sponsored by or adopted by such and such family. So if you're interested in that, make sure to call the church office and let them know that of your interest. Also on here, uh, even and more importantly, guess what? I have it on good authority that we're not going to be meeting in the parking lot for the rest of our life, okay? I have it on pretty good authority that that's not going to be the case, all right? But what we want to do, uh, we know that the, uh, our governor has kind of started us back to the road of re-entry. That's kind of what I'm going to call it, our re-entry pathway. And so we know that it's coming. We just don't know exactly when, but we want to prepare for that. So we want to hear from you. Uh, we can put the best plans together, but if you're not willing to walk in that way, what's the point, right? And so we want to get your input on how uh, you would feel safe in re-entering this environment, uh, the local church. And so uh, if you're online, go to our website. You can fill out the survey there. And if you're here in person, take this with you. Go home and fill out the survey so that we can get that information in. There are people that's already started to uh, put their opinions in place, and uh, it's uh, good to hear. Good to hear from everybody because we want everybody to come back into the house of the Lord and feel comfortable to do so. As we're uh, looking at what's going to happen today, uh, absolutely amazing. Thank you, God, for the beautiful sunshine and the light breeze that's going on. But let's, let's stop for a moment. Let's pause. Let's take a deep breath. Let's get rid of everything that we brought into this place and brought into this parking lot, brought into this moment so that we can focus on the Lord. Because I believe the Lord has a message for us today in His Word. I don't know about you, but I, I love Sundays when I can come together with God's people and hear God's Word. There's something special and unique about this experience. So let's go to the Lord right now. Father, we do thank You for today. We thank You for all that You do for us all week long. But Lord, we thank You more than anything for the special, special privilege it is to come together with brothers and sisters in Christ at church. Father, we love the gathering other brothers and sisters in Christ. It strengthens us. It encourages us. Father, gives us hope in times, well, times we might be hopeless. Father, thank you for the blessing that these people are to my life and to each other's lives. It is so difficult for this family, this local church family at First Baptist. It's so difficult for us not to be together. But Lord, you're bringing us through. We can see the light at the end of the tunnel, and that light is the light of the world. His name is Jesus Christ. We thank you. We thank you for the gift of salvation and for the hope of eternity. Father, thank you for all your blessings. Today, as we sing praises to your name and how good you are, Father, I pray that it becomes the, the very words of our heart, pouring out of our heart of praise and worship to you. And then, Father, as we look at our passage today in Genesis chapter 12, I pray that you would help us to identify and realize and understand how blessed we truly are. We love you, Jesus. It's in your matchless name I pray. Amen. Amen. 
book of Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Amen. Let's sing together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Better than heaven. Saints proclaim the power and might of His great name. Let us exalt on bended knee. Praise God the Holy Darkest night, you are close 
like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend And I have lived in the goodness of God Yeah All my life you have been there Somebody had their horn that was broke. Come on, they were just praising Jesus, right? I'll go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 12. That will be our text for today as we look at this idea, the concept of the new normal. The new normal. Last week we introduced uh, this text and, or this uh, series and we looked at the story of Noah, right? Noah. I mean, if there's anybody that we can talk about life in a new normal, it would be Noah. And this is a subject and a topic that we're hearing so much about in the culture and society today and, and the way that we're moving into this new season of life. Because we're hearing that everything, everything about the way that we live or the way that we live with, the, with each other is going to change, right? I mean, no longer are people going to be, uh, well, as uh, close or as personal with each other, or it's going to take a long time for people to get back to feeling comfortable uh, with hugging on each other and, and, and handshaking and clapping and being as intrapersonal as we once were. It's going to take us some time to get back to uh, what, we, well, what, what we once experienced. I mean, I think the days of social distancing, uh, they're going to be here with us for a while. And so we've got to be able to think about these things and how we're going to operate as we move into the future. How is our lives going to change because of all of this? But 
but really thinking about how we live today, thinking about the things that we go through today, uh, some of the stories in Scripture, which we're going to be looking at uh, for the rest of the month, Today we're talking about the character, the, uh, the, the, the man who lived so long ago called Abraham. Many of you will call him Father Abraham, and there's a kid's song, Sunday school song, around Father Abraham. But Abraham really did initiate the story of God and his people. As God initiated that conversation, uh, began that conversation with Abraham, and really you and I are here today in faith, as a product of Abraham's faith. The Bible teaches this all the way through. So Abraham plays a very important role in the faith conversation of, well, of Jesus Christ followers, the followers of Jesus Christ. And so today as we examine this story, it all has a, a personal application beyond what I think we fully give it context. I mean, we look at the story of Noah, and we were able to pull out some principles from Noah's story last week. We talked about how we don't have any control over the crisis of life, right? Well, Noah didn't have any control when it was going to rain or how it was going to rain. The only thing Noah could do is prepare for the crisis. And that's how we don't have any control over the crisis that happened in life, but we do see, based upon even Noah's testimony, that he obeyed the Lord, and because of his obedience in the midst of the crisis, God brought him through. And we know the same thing to be true of our own story, that God brings us through, and as we obey, he'll bring us through. And the last thing that we saw from Noah's story last week was this idea of worship. Worship is a key marker in this idea, this concept of the new normal. Now, when we talk about normal, let's make sure we're all on the same page, okay? Because some of you... Well, let's just be honest. Some of you are more normal than others, right? I mean, look at the person next to you. Look at the person in the, right? Some of you are more normal, so to speak, than the others. But in a spiritual sense, when we talk about this idea over the next several weeks, normal is not necessarily something that we want to strive to. Normal is not our standard. It's not the goal of which we're to strive to. Because we as followers of Jesus Christ, there's nothing in the Bible that calls us to be normal. The, the word, the context of what our lives are now we are now new. We are a new creation. And because there's a newness in our life, everything that we once knew to be normal is no longer normal. We're, we're not living in that way. Normal is defined as conformity to a standard. Conformity to a type. Conformity to a pattern. Okay? And so we, we look at this and identify what looks normal and what looks weird. Well, I'm here to tell you, y'all are weird people. You're followers of Jesus Christ. You're supposed to be weird. You are supposed to be strange. You are supposed to be a unique creation after God himself. God has brought you out of whatever normal standard of the world that there is to live in a new way. Now think about this, this idea of conforming, right? There are many Christians today that that is their primary goal is to conform to such an extent that they don't have to stand out. To conform, to be part of the woodwork and fabric of society so that they're not, uh, that nobody comes against them or nobody ridicules them or nobody stands out against their lives or against the message of their lives. I'm telling you, this is not what God has called us to. God has called us to stand up, stand out, and to speak out for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are not called to be normal. We are not called to look like the world, to act like the world, to think like the world. We are recreated in a new way. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm sorry, chapter 5 verse 17 says, Therefore, those of you that are in Christ, you are a what? A new creation. Old, old things, old things have passed away. Can I get a witness? Old things have passed away, right? Behold, all things, how many things? All things, how many things? All things have become new. That's our lives. That's who we are. This is the motto of our lives. Not those old things that are normal to everybody else, but the newness of, that comes with believing in Christ. We are new creation. And because we're a new creation, we're not supposed to be normal. Hello? <laughs> we're not supposed to be normal. That is not our goal. Our goal is to be like Christ. And Christ was anything but normal. So we're representing him today. We've taken on his name today in the world that we live in. And so the same way that he caused a disruption, he caused change in every environment that he entered. Well, in the same way, we are supposed to cause 
disruption. We're supposed to cause change. We're supposed to, as we go into a dark room, bring light. When you shine light into a dark room, it causes a total change in that environment. That is our role, our mission. That is what God has called us to do. Not to be normal, not to be in darkness, but to be new. To bring a newness, a light into the world in which we live in. And so today as we go into this story of Genesis chapter 12, and we look at the, this idea of Abraham, we look at his life, we have to understand that God is initiating a relationship with Abraham. And so, just kind of teach you for a moment. Okay, so this idea of covenant, covenant is something that you and I need to be comfortable with. Covenant is a relationship that we see described in the Bible between God and his people. We see two types of covenant. We see conditional covenants, and we see unconditional covenants. The difference between a conditional covenant and an unconditional covenant is that what happens in both parties. A covenant is an agreement or a relationship between two parties. An unconditional covenant is when one of those parties agrees to do everything for that relationship, agrees to do everything to make that relationship successful and prosperous. An unconditional covenant is when you enter into that relationship and both parties have responsibilities. Well, very quickly, God enters into an unconditional covenant with Abraham. This whole relationship with Abraham is going to depend upon God, not on Abraham. And as we look at this passage and understand the, the, the principles that are coming out, all of the verb tenses in this passage have to do with, they're, they're called pile imperfect. It's the Greek, it's the Hebrew verb tense, pile imperfect. It means an intensive or intentional thing that has happened and not happened yet. It's not been fulfilled yet. And so when God says, I will, I will, I will, I will, he's telling Abraham, I'm promising to do this, to do this, to do this, and to do this. So he calls Abraham, and all he says, Abraham, follow me. Follow my directions, follow my guidance. And Abraham does. Now that in itself should be something to cause us to pause for a moment and ask, why did Abraham have the faith that he had to be called out of his life and the existence that he had? He was living a good life. Everything was normal for him. He was enjoying prosperity. He was enjoying many things in life. Doesn't mean he had perfect life. But he was fine, just thank you. And then God shows up and changes everything. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show you. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless you and curse him that curses you. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And notice what Abraham does, verse 4. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. Now in this passage we find the words of the Abrahamic covenant. The covenant between God and Abraham where God was going to promise to do this, this, and this. God was going to give Abram, establish in Abram a great name, a great nation, and a great land. These are the three things that are promised to Abraham. Go to a land that I will show you. So Abram's supposed to get up and go on his way and not know where he's going. Hello? Has anybody got a problem with that? Right? I mean, when you're going someplace, you can put it in Google. You put it in MapQuest, right? You want to know where you're going and how you're going to get there, when you're going to take the next turn and what you're going to do. But this isn't the way that God worked with Abram. And guess what? It's not the way that God works in our lives either. God says, get up and go. Our response is to obey. It's not to say, God, give me all the details and all the things I need to know, and then I'll make a decision whether I'm to obey or not. No, our response is to obey before he even asks. That's our role. When our King of King and Lord of Lords says something, our role is to say yes without, without any questions. He says, Abram, go to a land that I will show you. I'm going to make your name great. Well, here's a problem. Abram didn't have any children at this time. Right? His wife Sarah was barren. She couldn't have children. And so when, when God tells Abram, I'm going to make out of you a great name and a great nation, that's a neat party trick. How's that going to happen? Well, God's going to do something 
impossible because he's the one who can. It was outside of Abram's control to do anything about this situation in his life. And as you read the story of Abram over the next 14 chapters in Genesis, you know one of his heart, things that tugged at his heart so much was to have lineage, have a child, have an inheritance. God was going to answer that for him. And so a land, an inheritance, a great name, a great nation. And then he was going to make him a blessing of all the families of the earth. And we know we follow the lineage from Abraham all the way to Jesus Christ, the Messiah. We know that this is a messianic promise that through the generations of Abraham, all the families, all the generations of the world will be blessed. What an amazing promise that God had given to Abram. Now, I have, I'm just reading into Genesis chapter 12 for a moment. Understand, this is something that, I don't know if you do it the same way I do it when I read the Bible. Maybe at home, slow down. Don't read to finish. Read to absorb. Read for change. Not for conformity, but for transformation. And so as we think about what happens to Abram, I mean, Abram knew and understood God in a certain way that I think some of us struggle with. I mean, think about it. Abram didn't have the benefit of the Bible like we have the benefit of the Bible. Abram didn't have the benefit of human history like we have 4,000 years ago. We have 4,000 years to identify the faithfulness and the goodness of God over all of those many generations. Abram didn't have that. God shows up out of nowhere and tells him to get up, leave his family, to get up and leave his, his tribe, to leave his household, and to move into a land that he wasn't even going to show him until he got there. Does that blow your mind? I mean, there must have been something about Abram that understood God in a different way than you and I do. I think Abram understood how big God is. You and I struggle, I think, at times with thinking about and understanding how big God is. If we truly understood how big and how powerful and how mighty God is, we would not delay in being obedient on anything that he asked us to do. I mean, what did Abram have to, to judge God's character by? Right? Abram probably knew the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Well, what happened in the first 11 chapters of Genesis to describe how big God is? Well, how about the first two chapters talking about God as the creator of the heavens and the earth? I mean, what an amazing God uh, just created everything by speaking it out of his mouth. You can't do that. Nobody can do that. I mean, I'm, I'm not struggling to understand if Abram, was he a, did he believe in creation or evolution? I guarantee you he believed in creation. I guarantee you he had no doubts about it that this God, this all-powerful creating God of the universe, had the power to do that. He could do anything in his life that he wanted to do because he was a big God and could accomplish anything like that. He also heard the story of the flood. We talked about that last week. The story of the flood, how he brought Noah in chapter 6 through 8 of Genesis through the worldwide flood. What a crisis. What a crisis. But God was bigger than even that type of disaster. He was bigger than anything that Abram would ever go through. Do you really believe that God is bigger than anything that you'll ever go through? I'm not sure you do. I'm not. Based upon some of the way that we respond on social media, based upon some of the ways that we respond in our conversation with the anxiety and the fear and the overwhelming panic that has been so prevalent over the last two months, I don't know if we know how big God is. I mean, do you recognize and understand that the creator of the universe, the one who sent all of these things in motion, how big and how awesome this God is? Why do you worry about anything if you're truly a follower of his? But here's what, here's what the problem comes in. The problem comes in is because we want to control our own destiny. We want to be in control rather than letting God be in control. And we get scared and upset and panicky when something is out of our control. Well, no, duh. Go ahead and say that in the comment box. No, duh. Okay? Because that's not, we're supposed to be weak. We're not going to be able to handle the situations, the circumstances, and the problems of the day. That's not our job. Our job is to trust God because He's in control. He's the one that has all of these things under His control. 
And so these problems and these circumstances that are out of our control well up in life and we don't understand how to get through them because we're not trusting this God who is so overwhelming and powerful, this mighty God that we serve, who can do anything. We want to trust in our own power. How? Well, there's a Greek word for that. That's not, that's not smart. <laughs> that's not the smart way to move. We need to trust God to let God be God and all we do is obey and follow him. And so one of the first things I think that I see in Abram is he knew how big God was. He let God be God, let God be in control. And all he did was obey. And I think that's the second thing we pull is this idea of obedience. We saw it in the life of Noah and we see it in the life of Abram. He obeyed. He didn't have all the answers, right? He didn't have all the answers. He didn't even know where they were going. But God called him up and out, and he got up and went out. Not knowing where they were going to end up, but knowing and trusting that God could make a way. And would make a way. This idea of obedience is something that we need to re-kind of get acquainted with in our own lives. And, and I, I just want to put a nugget of thought so that you can take this with you and chew on it today. Because every one of us understand what obedience is. We understand what disobedience is. But here's where I think we get kind of, there's a gray area in the middle. Because sometimes we, we qualify God. Well, God, I'll obey you if you do this. God, I'll obey you and do things your way if this happens this way. If things work out this way. If you heal me from this. If my relationship doesn't split. If my problems go away, then I'll follow you. That's not obedience. I don't know what you call it, but it's not obedience. I've come to understand that obedience is saying yes no matter what. And it's saying yes, oh, get this, people, with a good attitude. With a good attitude. Give me a thumbs up at home with a good attitude, right? It's saying yes with a good attitude. Tell my, uh, you tell your kids or your grandkids, go clean the room or go clean up after yourself or go do that. Go take the garbage out, right? And they huff and puff and whine the whole way through. Uh, that's not the obedience that God's looking for, but yet this is the way that we obey him. Just like the Israelites, grumbling and whining and complaining the whole way through. Partial obedience is not obedience, it's disobedience. Understanding who God is and leaning into what he's called us to do is what's going to bring us through the crisis that we find in life. So are you obeying God today? Let me ask you this. Just because we're going through a global worldwide pandemic, does that mean we hit the pause button on the mission that God has called us to? Does that mean the Great Commission is now on pause until we get back in the church building? Is the Great Commission on pause until they find a vaccination for the coronavirus? Is the Great Commission on pause until everything in our lives is back to normal? No, it's not. So my question is, who have you shared Jesus with this week? Who have you told about the goodness and the greatness of God this week? Who have you shared salvation can only comes through one name under heaven, and his name is Jesus. Have you done that this week? Because obedience, obedience is in regard of any situation or circumstance we're in, we're still called to be obedient to the call of God. So my question, how obedient have you been? Are you waiting until all things are working out in your favor? And then you'll start to obey again. That's not what God's looking for. God's looking at obedience through the crisis. Obedience through the crisis. We see this in Abram's life. We see that Abram knew how big God was. We see that Abram was obedient even when he didn't have all the answers. Didn't know what the end game looked like. And this is, I think, something that God does intentionally in our paths and our journey. He doesn't tell us what the end game looks like because the normal what will happen is we will make the game about us. We will try to get to that the way we want to get to that in the finish line. And as we plan our own strategy and our own way to the finish line, what happens? God doesn't get the glory for that. We do. Because we're really good about taking God's glory and putting it upon ourselves. 
So God doesn't give us what the end game looks like. All he wants us to do is to continue to obey him in the midst of the circumstance, in the midst of the crisis, in the midst of the journey. That way when we get to the end game, God's the one that gets the glory. And this is what happened in Abram's life. Abram didn't know what was going to happen, what was going on, what the next step looked like, what was hiding around the next corner. The only thing he could do is make a conscious decision to follow God in faith. And because of that faithful decision, it was counted unto him for righteousness. It was counted unto him for righteousness. What an amazing testimony. Amazing testimony, Abram, or Abraham, as he would later be called. As we think about our own journeys, we, do we know how big God is? Do we understand how big God is? Do we trust God, the omnipotent, all-powerful, all-knowing, creator of heaven and earth, who sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross? You know what this story here represents in Genesis chapter 12? This is the beginning of the redemption story. Right here is where the story of redemption begins. As God is calling Abram out from where he's at to go to a land that he would show him. He promised him a land. He promised him a name or an inheritance. A great nation. A nation that was so vast and so large it outnumbered the stars in the sky. Have you ever tried to count the stars in the sky? Have you ever? I mean, there's a lot of them up there, Jack. There's a lot of them up there. He's also compared the nation or the, uh, the people of the lineage of Abraham as compared to the dust on the ground. Good luck trying to count that. Huge, vast, unbelievable nation. But he also promised that he will be a blessing to all the families of the earth. This is the first time, the first promise, the messianic promise that God gives to Abram here that would eventually lead directly to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ being born of a virgin on the fullness of time on that night in Bethlehem. This idea that Abram's lineage was going to be a blessing to all nations. This is where the redemption story begins right here in this promise. Absolutely amazing. This, every story has a beginning. Right, Captain Obvious? Right, every story has a beginning. And so, what I want to ask you is, when does your story with God begin? When God had to come through the faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, God sent His one and only Son, Jesus, the Messiah, to come to earth to take our place on the cross, to pay for your sin and my sin. We can't pay for our own sin. We're all sinners. And so God had to step in and do that for us. He sent his one and only son, Jesus, the seed of Abraham, to come and to take our place on the cross. And by faith, placing our faith and trust, mentally assenting to the belief that Jesus did what he said he did, and that he could do what he said he was going to do. And then trusting in that fact with our whole heart, because our life depends on it. Our eternal life, our life today depends on the sacrifice Jesus made on the cross for us. Our life, our story begins with Jesus Christ. Have you crossed that threshold of relationship today? Have you come into an understanding and a relationship with Jesus Christ? If you haven't today, if you're here today and you have not, don't leave this parking lot without understanding that God loved you so much He sent His one and only Son on the cross to pay your penalty of sin. And by faith, you can receive forgiveness of your sins and a restored relationship with God. If you're at home today, don't let this broadcast in without making a decision to follow Jesus Christ, to place your faith and trust in Him and not in yourself. This whole crisis that we're going through as a human race, this global event, is to get the attention of humanity to place their faith in Jesus Christ. The one and only Son of God. Today, if you're joining us from home, what I want you to do, there's going to be posted in the comments section. It's a way to respond online to the message today. Respond online. If you're going to respond by saying, I today want to place my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, 
then respond in that way. And as you respond in that way, we will get some information that we'll be able to get to you about how to grow in this faith, to walk this journey of faith, to get started. Maybe you need some information about how to join a church that desperately wants to see people in a relationship with Jesus Christ, serving Him, looking forward to the amazing eternity promise that God has given us. Today, maybe there's, there's other things that you need prayer about. Go to this link that's being posted right now. Put in there so we can get in contact with you and follow up with you today. Church, I'm asking you today, how big do you think God is? Do you know how big God is? I'm asking you today to be obedient. To be obedient in the midst of the situation and the circumstances that you don't have the answers to. You don't know what the end game looks like. It doesn't matter. What matters today is that you're obedient to what God has called you to do and to be today. And today you cannot, you cannot move past the story of Abraham without asking yourself where you stand in eternity. Do you have a right relationship with God through the blood of Jesus Christ? Because the, the amazing promise that God gives concerning the salvation of all humanity begins right here with Abraham. Father, today we, we have to admit because of the situations and circumstances that are going around, Father, that we're not in charge. That we don't have all the answers. That, Father, we, we need to express our faith and obedience. Obedience in the moment, in the day in the, in the, that you give us, the hour in which we're in. Not to wait until all things are good, until all things are new. Because, Father, we're living in a world that is marred in sin. We're living in a world that, that is not perfect. We're living in a world that is not new. So we're to live as a new creation in an old world, and, Father, we struggle with that. We struggle with that. And so in so many ways, we need your help even today to understand the way that you've called us to live by faith. Just like Abraham shows us in his powerful testimony that by faith it was counted unto him as righteousness. That we don't have to have all the answers. We don't have to wait until all things are, are okay. That it's when things aren't okay, that's when our faith comes true. That's when our faith is made whole. That's when our faith is tested and tried and proven when we don't have all the answers. So, Father, I pray that you would give us strength and encourage us and give us hope today through the story of Abraham. and through this. He didn't live a perfect life. He messed up. He fell along the way and had to ask for forgiveness. But, Father, he said yes to you and started to follow where you would take him. Father, we can't, we can't follow you sitting on a couch for the rest of our lives. We don't follow you sitting in a pew for the rest of our lives. Maybe you've, you've closed the church. Maybe you've had us do things in a different way to get us up and to get us out of the church so that we can be faithful and obedient and following you in a new way in this season that you've given us. Father, I pray that you would go before us, continue to guide us, just like you guided Ada Abraham on his journey. Continue to guide us. Father, for those that are listening today, I just sense there's people listening all over, online all over the world. There's people listening even in this parking lot that have doubted their salvation, that have doubted that you are for them and that you are not against them. Father, I pray that you would take away those doubts today. That you would help them understand above, above all that you are for them. So much so that you gave your one and only son, Jesus, so that they could place their faith and trust in him and have a restored relationship for eternity with you. Father, they, you are trustworthy, that you are true, and that you are worthy. You are worthy of all praise. Father, as we go our way today and we live our lives for you this week, Father, I ask that you use us. I ask that you give us opportunities to be obedient in this week, to proclaim the name of Jesus, to live in worthy of the name in which we've been called, to show others, not only to tell others about the gospel, but to show others what a gospel life looks like. 
that we are not conformed to the ways of the world, but we've been transformed by the renewing of our mind and by the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Father, that we are not normal, that we are new, that you have created us to be new in this generation and in this day. Help us to go out and to cause change in the culture that you've given us today. As we represent and we tell this world about the goodness of God. Father, help us. Help us to live in power today. Father, as we go our way today, I ask that you bless the tithes and offerings are given whether they be given here on or online. I ask that you multiply them like you did the fishes and loaves so that ministry can be done here and around the globe like it never has been before with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that as our neighbors and our friends online, as they share the message today, as they share this message that it will go forth, then that your gospel would reach into the outer regions of the earth, that your gospel, your word would not come back void. Father, we thank you for the promises that you give us. And Father, we're committing to live in the midst of that promise, in the goodness of God. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Thank you again for being here today. And also online and on WNSS 89.3 FM in Palm Coast. God bless you and have a great day.